Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today is going to be such a good one. We have a medical doctor in store for you guys. Many of you guys already know who she is. She is beautiful. She is smart. She is intelligent. She has so much to share with us. Dr. O'Reilly, she is all the way in. Where are you again located? Sorry. <laughs> I am the north part of Louisiana, close to Louisiana. Dallas. That's right. Amazing, Louisiana. And this is going to be such a good one, you guys. You're going to want to stick around to the end. She has been vegan plant-based for 10 years. She is high raw. She used to be fully raw vegan, I believe. We'll find out why she incorporated some cooked food. And you guys have so many amazing questions for her. So we have so much to cover. Let's hop right into it. How are you? I'm great, Julian. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you on. And you're a medical doctor. You've been in the medical industry, I believe, over half of your life, right? Yes. Amazing. It's hard to think about it. But yeah, I've been in medical school since uh, 18 years old. So yeah, yeah, half of my life, more than half of my life. Yeah. And do you experience like any pushback or backlash in the medical community being like vegan plant-based or are you seeing more of that now? Not really. I mean, when I went vegan, it was in 2013. So by that time, uh, everybody here in the States was more aware about plant-based diets. So not really. I experienced pushback in Mexico, not necessarily, but more like curiosity rather yeah. than criticism when I went vegetarian. I was vegetarian when I was in my country and then I moved here. That's when I transitioned into veganism. Yeah. And what, what led you to transition to vegan? And did you see a big difference going from vegetarian to vegan? Like what kind of benefits and experience did you personally have? Yeah. So I went Atkins before my plan based journey because I wanted to lose weight. So a colleague of mine during my, um, in Mexico, we have something called social service, which you pay back to the community because medical school is not necessarily free, but almost free. So you pay back one year of your of your training, uh, serving a underserved community. So in that community, I was with a colleague and she implemented Atkins diet, which is basically animal protein three times a day. Mm -hmm. wow. No food, no carbs, nothing. Because I wanted to lose weight after an internship that was, you know, so taxating to my body, uh, sleep deprived, you know, eating late night and all of that. So I went Atkins and that was my first awareness to diet, that diet, what you eat is important to your health. So after losing a little bit of weight, or I, I would say like five to 10 kilos, that made me aware that diet has an influence in our weight and our well-being. So I started investigating more about vegetarianism because for me, the Atkins diet was not sustainable. I was relying on caffeine all the time just to have the energy because I didn't have any carbs, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so after that, I discovered the benefits of vegetarianism, implementing fiber in your diet and all of that. So I went vegetarian back in 2008, 2009. And then I lasted five years as a vegetarian. What prompted me to go vegan is because despite the benefits of increasing plant-based diet in, 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 my, in my life, I watch Earthlings and overnight I, I switch you know, to veganism because I was so shocked by what I saw on that movie. And then eventually, you know, I started investigating more about the benefits of eliminating dairy, mm. uh, how polluted is the fish and all of that. So yeah, that yeah. was, that, that prompted me to go vegan. Yeah. Wow. And you haven't looked back 10 years. Have you experienced like a blissful 10 years? Has it been amazing? Take us through your journey a bit. Have there been any problems at all? Yeah. At the beginning, I mean, I knew a little bit about nutrition Many people have touched base on the fact that medical doctors don't receive a lot of nutrition science education. When I was in medical school, you know, probably I got like less than 24 hours in the whole six years of my career of nutrition. And it was more like, what are carbohydrates? What is protein? And things like that. Not necessarily, oh, processed meat is bad for you. Not at all. So, so yeah, I basically, when I went vegan, because I didn't have the education, I learned on the side by myself because I was so interested in the topic and I also didn't want it to fall into deficiencies. Mm -hmm. I knew that vitamin B12 was a requirement, but I didn't supplement it for the first, I would say, couple of years into veganism. I mean, when I was vegetarian, I was getting eggs, dairy, so I didn't have to worry. But now as a vegan, I kind of neglected it because my my profession was so demanding that I, you know, I didn't take care of myself. The worst patients are doctors, believe it or not. So I wasn't so, you know, concerned about it until I started developing tingling in my fingers. Wow. So tingling in your fingers is a sign of B12 deficiency. Scary. Memory problems. Scary. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And then I started like, oh yeah. And I read about it and I like, I need to supplement with B12. 
so many people neglect vitamin B12 supplementation, but I think that's a key role, not yeah. only for, you know, anemia, because B12 has so many functions, uh, nerve function, brain function, memory, blood production, red blood cell production, but not only that, prevention of strokes. Mm, wow, that's linked to B12? Yes. No way, wow. Yeah. And that's yes. huge. Wow. And you see many vegans, I mean, you see in the news and, uh, you know, sensationalist news, they say, oh, he was vegan, she was vegan and died or suffered stroke. Why? Maybe B12 plays a role. So I always emphasize, you know, it's not a matter of, oh, I'm not anemic. Why do I need B12? Oh, I don't have any problems. And B12, it helps with the formation of our red blood cells too, right? Yeah, red blood cells, nerve function, brain function, memory, and prevention of cardiovascular disease and strokes. So that makes sense. It's all tied to that. That's so important. You don't want to yeah. mess around with that, right? No, no. Especially during development. And if you're pregnant and if you have children, you know, you can have some reserves here and there, but why would you compromise the health of your, you know, offspring? Yeah. Why would you compromise yourself? yourself? No. Why would Promise your veganism if it can be prevented. Yeah, that was one of the biggest mistakes in my life because like you, the first couple of years I was vegan, I didn't supplement with B12 yes. or anything. And it, it reversed going raw vegan. It reversed all my health problems. And it literally made me feel like my true self, my best self, my highest self. And I was just like, wow, I know this is the way. And I kind of thought like I had the mentality, which was really, it wasn't smart, but I mean, live and learn that I didn't need supplements. And then I had a pregnancy a couple of years after. And I didn't supplement the pregnancy, which is just looking back. It's just the biggest mistake of my life. I've learned to like forgive myself and thank God my daughter's okay. But yeah. it's like you said, I think it's so important if people are going to be vegan in pregnancy or raw vegan or any diet, maybe like check your blood work, make sure you have your B12, make sure you have all these things, right? Because we want our babies to grow, their brains to thrive, their body to thrive. And yeah. Yeah, yeah probably you had a lot of reserves. So thankfully, you know, nothing happened, but yeah, so many people are vegan since birth and then they have children and it's like, okay, just just pay attention. And and the best way, as you said, just do a test and see how you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and like I said, like she was okay, but we were in the hospital when she was one because we realized she was deficient in things. Wow. From me breastfeeding for the whole first year of her birth too. Right. I'm breastfeeding and not supplementing. And then we did have, so I think it's just so key. And what, what other supplements do you think are important? Like to me, I take an all-in-one. It has B12, zinc, iodine, K2, DHA, EPA, magnesium, selenium. Do you think we need to go as hardcore and like make sure we're supplementing all those things? Or do you think just like B12 and D and how often should we check our blood work? What should we ask for at the doctor to check? Yeah, I mean, I think those are, that's a great supplement. I think those are most of the things that could be deficient in vegans especially raw vegans, because we eliminate salt, you know, you fall in this natural, um, natural hygiene principle, sometimes like salt has to be eliminated altogether, things like that. So yeah, I think that's a great supplement. You mentioned most of the elements are important. If you want to, I mean, I don't know if you want to ask me about it, but if you want to build muscle and preserve muscle, mm. I would say sub, um, supplement with protein or increase the amount of protein in your diet. And sometimes that comes at the expense of not being necessarily 100% raw vegan. Um, some people say creatine. I haven't taken creatine and I'm seeing muscle mass gains. So, you know, it's negotiable. It's not like a must, but some people say creatine, but it's not vital as iodine or vitamin D or vitamin B12. So I think what you cover is really good. Yeah. And you look fit, like your protein, your fitness levels are like on point. I want to talk I wasn't about like this before. I, I wow. think it's working. Yeah. And yeah, we have to talk about protein because I know that's a big thing. So let's touch on protein and fitness. So I have seen people like I interviewed Kara Brotman. I do know a few other raw vegan friends and YouTubers who have decided to go higher raw and incorporate some cooked plant foods like uh, lentils and beans and tofu and tempeh and all these things because they say personally for them, they can reach higher fitness levels in the gym and it just makes them feel better. Is that why you started adding, adding in those types of foods, I believe, after being yeah. high raw? And do you think those can really help us with our protein levels? Yeah, absolutely. So if you don't track yourself and if you eat intuitively, so to speak, you will disregard the information of, or of the importance of tracking yourself. Because most of the fitness competitors, for example, and we're not talking about achieving those levels, but the, the reason why these people get results is because they measure everything on a scale. Mm -hmm. For the normal person, you know, 
it's not necessary. But the more I look into it, the more I realize that to age gracefully, and not only to preserve muscle mass, but to preserve integrity of other tissues that require protein as well, I think we need to go higher than what is promoted in the extreme cleansing community that constant, you know, mono milling on certain type of fruit or things like that. I appreciate and I see the value on mono milling and simplifying and all of that. And some people don't have fitness goals. Some people don't care yeah. about having muscle mass as they get older. But I think it's super important to get, you know, all your tissues with integrity as you get older. So I think that's the reason why I turn the page and I said, okay, what other people are saying? I usually don't disregard information that is coming from the carnivore tribe because I want to test what they're saying to my current lifestyle. You know, sometimes you are in an echo chamber of people telling you the same thing over and over again, and that just confirms your biases. That just mm -hmm. reaffirms what you believe. In my case, it's like, yeah, I obviously, you know, I'm not going to go carnivore. However, it's like, yeah, what is the missing ingredient or what quantities, what could be missing in the raw vegan diet in terms of protein that not necessarily have to be supplemented with meat. If I can find a reciprocate on the plant-based world, why not? So I realized that the quantities of protein requires for muscle growth or optimizing muscle development while working out, because if you're using increased protein without working out, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So while working out and also preserving it and keeping it in your body, and not compromising other organs that also require protein, I feel like we need to increase the protein amount. Yeah. And like you're saying, just like exercising, I know some people don't have fitness goals, but I think just exercising movement, it's so important, especially as we get older. I interviewed somebody the other day. She's been plant-based since she was 47. She's 89. And she noticed as she was aging, she was starting to get really frail. And even on a super clean diet, like her body was getting really affected until she started working out. Now she's deadlifting at 89. She's doing all this. She feels amazing. So I just think for the function of our body and living our best life, it's important we get moving, whether that's like exercise outside that we enjoy or in the gym. I've been in the gym recently too. And you do look good. Is there any way that we can measure the protein? Like, is there any blood tests we can do? How can we measure? Yeah. Like, how that's how a great can we question. measure that we're getting enough protein? The protein levels are good. So if you are on a balanced raw vegan diet, meaning you just, you're not only monomilling on I don't know, nectarines, for example, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and if you are eating plenty of leafy greens, plenty of vegetables, plenty of nuts, seeds, sprouts, and all of that, you know, a complete balance rubbing diet, you're not going to get protein deficient. Like there is not such thing as protein deficiency in the blood that can be measured and revealed on a test or lab uh, result. It's not the same as anemia and iron, for example. You can easily take a blood, uh, do a blood work, take a sample, and they're going to tell you, you know what, your ferritin is low, uh, your hemoglobin is low. That's how we know we have, you know, lack of iron sometimes and you need iron, right? So protein is not measured at that level because protein is not circulating in the blood uh, in a way that indicates deficiencies or excess. Mm -hmm. The blood and the homeostasis and the body has uh, a way to keep protein levels like albumins and other globulins in the blood at a certain level, like no more, no less. Same as the pH, because... If we don't have enough protein circulating in our blood, we're gonna get we're gonna get how can I say not bloated. Um, I'm looking for a word uh, swollen. Mm. If you keep the oncotic, wow. yeah, oncotic pressure means the protein is pulling water into the circulation. So if you don't have enough protein in your circulation, that fluid in your blood is gonna go to your tissues, and you're gonna get swollen or with edema, right? So the mm -hmm. oncotic pressure is such a regulated mechanism, similar to the pH. You cannot go to, into acidosis or alkalosis or, you know, um, yeah, alkalinity without dying. The pH mm -hmm. is regulated very, very, very tight in our body and the same with protein. So if somebody says, I'm not protein deficient, I, do a, I did a blood work and it shows that I have nice albumin levels, nice globulin levels. It doesn't, it's not measured that way. The only way that you can measure it is to see how are your bones doing? Like how dense your bones are? Uh, how is your hair? How are your nails? How is your skin? How is your collagen? Yeah. Do you think you're losing the turgency or, of your skin faster than usual? Do you feel weak? Do you feel like, yeah, I'm energetic, but I don't feel strong. You know, things like that are indicators that you may be protein deficient. Mm -hmm. So it's more objective 
and more like self-reflection and really like an honest evaluation of yourself. Like, you know, is my hair looking good? Is my skin looking good? My nails, you know, are they brittle? True. Are they, yeah. Those so, could all be signs of protein deficiencies, right? Too, like protein yeah. problems. Yeah. Cause our hair is made up mostly of protein, right? And we need protein for our nails to thrive and everything. Yes, exactly. So yeah. what happened to me and, you know, I haven't, I, I think I said that in, in some of my posts, but I started working out heavily, like overnight, because yeah. that was like a year ago. And I noticed that my hair was uh, getting thinner and I started losing wow. some, like, this is not normal. Yeah. Once I started supplementing with protein because I want I wanted to do it in a raw vegan form. And it was challenging. Uh, because as I said, if you don't track yourself, you're not gonna be able to see how many grams of protein you are ingesting out of your raw foods. So with this trainer, uh, she was like, You need to track yourself and and you know, really hit these targets, which is one pound or yeah, one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to do it in a raw vegan version, I was falling short, and I was getting close to 90. And that was really trying hard. Wow. And uh, I noticed my hair, you know, was compromised. Wow. So I, I incorporated, you know, the tempeh, the tofu, uh, the raw vegan protein powder and all of that. My hair problem resolved. I got more gains and yeah, the rest is history. Did you notice this is kind of not, well, kind of related, but kind of not. Did you notice as a doctor, like I know with the pandemic, with people getting that, having the COVID and stuff, I know a lot of people like close to me and I've seen a lot of people who also had like bad hair loss after getting that. Have you as a doctor seen that? I know that's kind of off topic, but, or no. Yeah. The hair loss problem. Yeah. I, I not on myself. Yeah. I think I got COVID a couple of times or whatever it was. But no, I didn't experience that. What I experienced was a uh, loss of smell. Mm -hmm. I, I lost my smell mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. But other than that, no. Yeah. But and I, I know you talk. Therapy. Yeah. There are people who have, right? I've seen that's a big thing. And I know you talked about bones. So that just reminded me a little bit. You brought up the bones and like bone health. A lot of people think in order to have strong bones, avoid osteoporosis, avoid like breaking bones as you fall when you get older or having strong bone health that we need to have the milk, we need to have the dairy from the cows, from the animals, we need that in order to live our best. But I think from studies I've seen in a lot of stuff that's circulated, correct me if I'm wrong, or I'd like to hear like what you know on this topic, that the countries that consume the most of those things actually have the most osteoporosis and the most bone problems and things like that. So what do you see as a doctor? What are your thoughts on that? What are the best ways to supplement for the animal based calcium in our vegan diets? Yeah, so for uh, bone tail, there are so many factors, and obviously one of them is calcium. And I think that the milk and dairy industry use that uh, calcium as a marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, remember back in the 1990s, got milk and the mustache yeah. and milk. And that. But I feel like there are so many elements to make your bones stronger, not only calcium. And calcium is mm. in leafy greens, you know, dark leafy greens, pop choy, celery, tofu, <laughs> you know, believe it or not, is supplemented with calcium. And um, yeah, oranges. So I like, as I said, if you eat a raw vegan diet that is mm -hmm. balanced, calcium will not be a problem. Same with veganism, you know, cook vegan, not a problem. However, not only calcium is important for bones, also uh, vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So that's why the people in the Northern hemispheres and, you know, those who most of our elderly patients, you know, and, and, and white people, unfortunately, it's because they don't get exposed to sunlight and obviously they don't produce their own vitamin D if they don't supplement, right? So yeah. bone mineral is not only calcium, which can be easily achieved in a plant-based diet if you are strategic about it, you know, know your numbers. That's why I always encourage people, track yourself to see how you're doing. Um, yeah. The other aspect is vitamin D. If you're not in the tropics, most of us are vitamin D deficient to a certain level or in, yeah. our, in Canada. So probably you don't get enough sunlight, especially in, during winter. So those two things and resistance training. So if there is nothing that pulls or pushes your bones that causes a little bit of stress, your bones become fragile because mm -hmm. the bones need that, that challenge, you know, to be able to resist the impact or any, any, anything that hurts you. Like if you fall and you broke a bone is maybe because, you know, you never exercise, you never put some resistance in your bones. So the muscle themselves, you know, are inserted in our bones. So mm -hmm. that direction, pulling and pushing, that's what makes the bone get denser and stronger. Mm -hmm. And I know with vitamin D, like nothing really quite compares to the sun, obviously, but I live in Toronto, Canada this year. 
when I was doing a vit, I decided to try the vitamin IV drip therapy. Have you ever heard of these? So no. I did that. And then they had a uh, vitamin D. I decided to do a vitamin D shot. He was like, it's really clean. It's just vitamin D. So I was like, okay. And I did the drip therapy. Yeah. I was wondering your thoughts on the drip therapy. It's like a big mainstream thing. Now you see a lot of podcasters doing it, you know, where it's like a vitamin drip and it's like a lot of electrolytes, it's hydrating and they put B vitamins, amino acids, any of these things you might need. So, but yeah, you haven't heard about those. No, I, I'll be honest. I know, I don't know anything about it. So I can, oh, I can, yeah. Make- yeah. Okay. No problem. And I'm just wondering in your opinion, what are the top like plant-based sources where we can get whether cooked or raw for protein, amino acids, and iron? I think those are like three big things. So like anything that comes to mind in your opinion for like the top sources where we can hit our targets in those areas? Yeah. So if you want to be hyper vegan like me, and that's why I went hyper vegan because of yeah. that reason. It will be, if you want to be like supernatural, like you don't want anything processed or the least processed, mm-hmm. it would be lentils over beans. Um, so just one cup of lentils can give you nine grams of protein compared to one cup of uh, cups of beans. One cup of beans can give you just seven grams. You know, we're talking about single digits. So yeah, lentils over beans are great sources. You know, is you can eat more beans and get more proteins, right? So it's also uh, the amounts. Uh, if you are careful, like you can, you can weigh yourself yourself. And if you don't go below uh, beyond your caloric needs, you're not gonna gain weight, even if you, because that's the concern. I've seen that you know, like people commenting and messaging me, like, but if you have to gain weight, you gain weight because you are eating extra. It doesn't matter if it's cooked or raw. Anyway, so the question. If it's cooked sources, lentils, beans, if you don't want to eat tofu. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't have any problems with soy. I do it organic, non-GMO, no problem. Mm -hmm. So tempeh over tofu for uh, more protein, but both are great sources of protein. If you want to go like more processed, which I don't don't see any problem because I trust a company that sells the protein powder I consume. So you can go to the protein powders. But it's just a matter of preference. Some people don't like the filler. Some people think that they have heavy metals and pesticides. So you really need to trust the lab. You really need to call them and see that if they have like third party certification and testing. Mm. That way you're sure that the ingredients that they display, you know, is warranty that you're And what one do you use in case people are wondering like what? Oh, um, (laughs) I don't know. I mean, if we can say brands, but I, I went through a lot of experimentation so because I saw so many raw vegan influencers like big names promoting Sun Warrior, I just mm-hmm. went with that. Uh, I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's the same reaction for other people, but in terms of safety and all of that, I wasn't concerned. But I just mm-hmm. didn't like the way it made me feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I switched to Vivo. I, I like Vivo. I haven't tried anything else just because I like that. Yeah, um, cool. I also go for the more natural protein powders that are not commercial, mm-hmm. but they're you know, you find a lot of options on Amazon, like, and they probably can be more raw than the others, you know, protein powders, like uh, hemp protein powder. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's just, they just get rid of the oil and mm-hmm. you just keep the fiber and the protein. Yeah. So that's a good one. Uh, pumpkin protein powder as well. That's use, a good one. Yeah. yeah. So okay. those basically are my main sources. I don't complicate things because the more, you know, ingredients I put in things like the more bloating, the more, you know, we, we know the principles of keeping it simple in the raw vegan world. So the same applies for high raw vegan, you know. So, yeah, I mean, if I can mention five tempeh, tofu, lentils, protein powder. And if you want to keep it raw, plenty of leafy greens. But we're talking plenty of leafy greens, like four heads of romaine lettuce, right? For example, mm-hmm. per day. Yeah. Sprouts. I, I was forgetting this. Sprouts. Those are great sources of protein. Like if you want to sprout your lentils and keep it raw, go for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, beans can be sprouted as well. I just don't like the taste, to be honest with you. Like they they, they, they taste bitter sometimes, mm-hmm. but it can be done if that's your preference for sure. Yeah. Okay. And what about iron? Do you think we can meet our iron needs with the plant foods just Absolutely. the same? And what foods are like your go-tos for that? Or if somebody asks like, what are the top, you know, say you saw, had somebody come in with low iron, what would you advise them to eat? For as far as plants go to up their iron game yeah at the top of my i don't have like a like the top 10 but i would say plenty of dark leafy greens some people have issues with you know oh those are goitrogenic i haven't had any issues in 10 years 
Mm -hmm. uh, if you have hypothyroidism, don't go for the cruciferous veggies, right? Or hyper, whatever thyroid problems you may have, okay, go for other sources. But I feel like all dark leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, black beans, lentils that have plenty of iron, I would say you take a supplement that is a vegan supplement that has iron as well. So I don't see any problem. Like again, if you eat a balanced raw vegan or high raw vegan or cooked vegan diet, and if you want to throw a supplementation, that's fine. I don't see problems with that. So yeah. yeah. And I think dates, dates are pretty high in iron too, right? Dates, yeah. Yeah. Now the, with the problems with dates is that you know, it can cause teeth. problems with your teeth. Yeah. My daughter, she's gone plant-based and I've seen a huge transformation in her. She's only 11. She will not eat any junk food. I don't, I don't know what's happened. It is a huge transformation. I'm just like, wow, she still eats some animal products. So she does eat chicken, salmon, and eggs, but her diet is like whole foods, nothing processed. And she loves dates. So I always tell her like, careful with the dates. If you're going to eat them, swish with water, floss after, like be really careful because of that too. And what do you think for amino acids? You know, some people say, well, on this diet, you can't reach your amino acids needs. Like, do you have any foods that come to mind or how do you think we should ensure that we're getting the proper amino acids? So yeah, amino acids are the structural uh, units of protein. So I always put this example, like if you have a house of bricks, every wall of the house has bricks and every single brick is an amino acid. So there are 20 nine essential, I, I always forget the numbers, but I think nine are essentials, meaning we need to ingest them from, from the external sources. The other 11, we can produce them or recycle them. But every single brick, for example, leucine, methionine, lysine, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So all of those can be found in plants. It's just a matter of the amounts. So there is this argument whenever people want to not debate me, but, you know, just say that they're shocked to find that I'm going for the protein argument because I mean, we vegans have fought so, so hard mm -hmm. to make people aware that plants have protein. Mm -hmm. So going in this direction, like, Hey guys, pay attention to your protein from a vegan or raw vegan. It's like, what are you saying? You know, <laughs> like amino acids are in plants. That's all we need. We need the building blocks, right. Of that wall that is going to make the full protein, which is the the house. So mm -hmm. yes, but it's the amount of amino acids that we're talking about. So let's say watermelon, if you eat a hundred grams of watermelon, that's not going to give you one gram of protein, mm -hmm. one gram of protein. If you break down that gram, maybe you have few molecules of lysine, few molecules of tryptophan, few molecules of alanine, you know, but for protein and muscle synthesis, you need other types of amino acids, which is losing another couple. So it's just the amount that is required for that and the particular distribution of certain amino acids in that in that protein. So yes, plants have protein, but how much? Mm -hmm. And what is the distribution of amino acids inside that protein? So one cup of watermelon, 100 grams, it's going to give you one gram of protein compared to one cup of lentils that is mm -hmm. going to give you close to 10 grams of protein. And the amino acid distribution of lentils versus watermelon is higher in the lentils. Yeah. So that is a trade-off. Of course, you're going to feel not as energetic and live alive, you know, as the watermelon, but it's also a matter of the microbiome getting adjusted to it. I don't mm -hmm. feel as, how can I say, drain of energy after eating a cooked bowl of lentils as before. Mm -hmm. Now I feel like my microbiome can digest it. I'm not going to lie. I prefer feeling the, you know, energy of the watermelon, but it's a trade-off, you know, that I'm willing to, to pay off. Yeah. And we need all sorts of things, not just the yeah. watermelon. Maybe there's a yeah. morning for just the watermelon and then thanks for everything else. I think we need like a big variety. And yeah. I just want to say like, you are actually the healthiest looking doctor I've ever seen. Like if I think uh -huh. of doctors, <laughs> like I live in Toronto, I've seen a lot of doctors in my life. If I think of like, you know, so how blessed people are to have you as their doctor, that's amazing. And you're doing such a good job at what you're doing. And what are some of like the big health problems you're seeing these days as a doctor, like come through the office? And do you think like a lot of them are diet based? Well, um, so just to clarify, I'm a pathologist. Mm -hmm. So I stopped seeing patients face to face back in. So I graduated in 2000 and when did I graduate? 2008. Yeah. So that was my last encounter. Uh, we were talking about my social service, right? When I went. To yeah, Atlanta. that's right. Um, that's when I saw patients face to face coming to my office. After mm -hmm. that, I went into my specialty, which is pathology. And then I subspecialized in neuropathology. So Wow. Face to face patients coming to my office hasn't happened since then. However, 
I'm really, really in the medical system because there is no other way I can practice rather than in a hospital and mm -hmm. in a tertiary care hospital where all the people that are super sick come to my office, but not, you know, the person, little parts. So I, I analyze pieces of tissue from that person. Let's say you're concerned, hopefully not, you know, or somebody else. Uh, they have a mole and they don't know if it's melanoma or just mm -hmm. like a benign nevus. So the dermatologist takes an ellipse biopsy they send it to the lab. My technician gives me the slide, the glass slide, and I look it up in the microscope. So I tell, I, I issue diagnosis to the primary doctor. I said, listen, this is benign nevus. You don't need to worry. Or this is melanoma. They need to undergo like a more radical surgeries, things yeah. like that. So I am really, really into the medical system to know exactly the severity of the diseases that I see on a daily basis, because I see hundreds of cases mm -hmm. from skin problems to brain problems to, you know, thyroid problems. Um, most of these people have, I always look at the chart. Like if I see a very malignant tumor, I'm mm -hmm. like, oh my God, what is this person doing? Mm -hmm. I open the chart and I immediately see most of them are obese or overweight. Mm, wow. Most of them like, okay, lung cancer. This patient has a brain metastasis of lung cancer. What is this patient doing? Mm, smoking all his life, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Cancer, that's the worst thing that I, 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 I see under the microscope on a daily basis. And I'm always curious, you know, what is this person doing? How is how is their weight? It's always in the upper range, unfortunately. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Okay. And while you're doing something right, look at you, right? You're thriving. So I'm curious to know what's your daily routine look like? Like, what does your exercise routine look like? What is sort of nurturing your mental health and you know there's it's not just food right it's not just food yeah. and working out it's also like surrounding yourself with the right people like what are your keys to health in all areas and how do you incorporate that in your daily routine and also like what do you eat in a day what are some of your favorite recipes yeah I mean there are so many things that I need to improve on I'm I, I am far beyond perfect I really need to you know procure more I would say relationships but you know other than that I procure to have good relationships in my in my workplace however I feel like sleep is so underrated. Yeah, right? I know. Like when I, I mean, I've been in medical school all my life and during all my years of training, I've been sleep deprived. I, I think that if I haven't, if I had procured my sleep better, I would look much better or I will feel much better. But um, yeah, sleep is is vital. Even if you're raw vegan, sometimes we feel like, oh, I don't need so much sleep because raw foods is like, you know, it's amazing. You need yeah, to sleep. But, if, mm -hmm. but if you're sleeping less than six, seven hours per, per night, not good, regardless of you're robbing it or not. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing would be, uh, of course, movement. Your preferred sport is the one that is going to work for you. Before I went uh, high raw and before my strength training, I used to run a lot. I really like mid-distance, long-distance running, like mm -hmm. 10Ks, half marathons, two marathons I did in my life. But I was more focus on speed and being super slim and, and light because the slimmer you are, the faster you are, right? Now I can see that I would rather have good mass as I age because I'm going to eventually lose it. So the more I preserve it, the better for my bone health and all of mm -hmm. that well, fractures, right? So my routine, I would say I'm procuring my, my sleep a little bit more. So let, my routine starts the night before. So the night before I prepare what I'm going to eat the next day. So for example, today is Sunday. So around 6, 7 p.m., I'm going to start preparing for the next day. I try to have dinner before 7. So let's imagine that I had my dinner already. I'm preparing my food for the next day. So what I do is I put in my blender all my, sm my smooth ingredients, right, for the next day because I wake up around 5, 5.30 to go to the gym. <laughs> so before my workout, I drink half of my smoothie. And after the workout, I drink the other half. Just oh, to have smart. That's smart. Yeah. yeah. So my smoothie is basically berries, banana, and a protein powder. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I take a shower, get ready for work, hit the office. I start, you know, organizing my cases, you know, talking with the residents, what cases are coming, things like that. And in the interim, I basically have another meal, which is a fruit bowl with more seeds or if I want like a, a pudding with chia seeds, things like that, that's another big meal. Um, then during the day, I drink my matcha green tea or sometimes I drink coconut water or green juice, 
whatever is handy. Sometimes I forget to to get my green juice because I don't have time for using. I know it's the best thing that you can do, fresh juice, but I wish I had the time. Yeah. Uh, but I'm inspired from, you know, Whole Foods is uh, cold press. So, uh, so that happens during the morning that I'm working, you know, I'm drinking my, 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 my drink. And then uh, lunchtime, I have a big meal again, which is like my raw vegan salad supplemented with the protein, whether it's, and, and the raw vegan salad has protein. Don't, don't. Yeah, for sure. Wrong. Yeah. But for my goals, I try to get 30 grams of protein per meal. So I get like a big piece of tempeh or a big block of tofu or, you know, a cup of lentils, things like that. And then, so that's, I have a late lunch around 2, 3 p.m. And then when I go to, to my house around 5, I either have another small salad or uh, more fruit, things like that. But I don't have, yeah. I, I switch, you know, before I, I learned from so many raw vegan, raw vegan teachers that it's better to have your big salad and your fats at night. To me, that doesn't work very well because I feel so heavy. Mm-hmm. So I'd rather have my, my big meal around 2 p.m. And then at night is something lighter. Yeah. I like so, that idea better. That makes sense, you know, then you sleep better. Yeah. 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 You more energized and yeah, you're just tired at the end of the day, but not because you are, how can I say, like, what, there is a name for it, like a food coma, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what we're trying to avoid, right? <laughs> those yes. food comas. I mean, mind you, maybe if that's your thing, then get into your food coma. But I don't like the way that feels anymore after feeling mm-hmm. like this. But yes. you mentioned matcha. So I actually just tried a matcha smoothie this week. It's It was delicious. I've never had matcha before. And I had a couple of matcha smoothies from a local place here in Toronto, and they were really good. Do you think there's a lot of benefits to matcha? And is that an important thing? Do you incorporate every day? Yeah, you know, you're going to have mixed opinions. I mm. I don't believe that caffeine is bad for you necessarily if you don't abuse it. You know, you know there is a very blurred line between just eating raw foods for the sake of the benefits of raw foods and then going into the other camp, which is caffeine is bad, you know, uh, cooked food is bad, um, detoxification communities and fasting and using and retiring. So, so that's another, like a whole world, right? Yeah. But there's like intertwining between those worlds so for me it's just like I look at people who have drank coffee like just one cup um, during the morning just to wake up and be focused they don't have any problems some people say it decalcifies you it's acidic Mm -hmm. listen acidity and alkalinity is heavily regulated as I described at the beginning so it's not gonna happen you know you're not gonna be toxic out of one cup of coffee so it has caffeine matcha on the other hand has uh, theobromine and probably a little bit of caffeine that it's it's converted in certain metabolites that um, exert the same effects of caffeine but it's not as how can I say taxing to your body mm-hmm. and it's an antioxidant rich and it's it's basically like a powderized green tea leaves alive some mm-hmm. some matches have different qualities than the others so Ones are dried leaves and the others are just desiccated, kind of like the dehydrator process. So mm-hmm. I don't see any problem. I don't see any crash in my energy. So it just keeps me going. Yeah. If and I it doesn't learn... feel as tense, right? It doesn't feel as intense as like coffee no, or like raw cacao and stuff. Yeah. 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 So if I didn't have a job that requires me to focus so much, probably I wouldn't need it. But I would rather make a good diagnosis because I'm focused than, oh, I don't and, want to be like super toxic with the match. I don't see any problem to be honest. It's a pretty good thing to have. It's not like you're having a Red Bull. You know what I mean? To stay focused. Right, it's not exactly. like you're like, give me a monster energy drink or load me I'm up. I'm justifying my, my choices, you know? <laughs> yeah, right? Yes. And as somebody who's like in the medical field and so, as somebody just in general who's passionate about plants and eating more plants, have you read any interesting studies over the last 10 years, 20 years, however long time? that come to mind or seen any cases personally of people where like they had problems and then they just decided to eat more plants and it turned them around like anything that comes to mind? Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, so many studies that support the consumption of more plants, right? Mm-hmm. But I one in particular that uh, draw my attention was when I was doing my fellowship in neuropathology. And that's an article that I presented in the, they, they call it like grand rounds where you make like a big presentation to the auditor and full of doctors and students. So I choose that topic where they describe how modifying the microbiome in mice that are knocked out for Parkinson's disease, if you transfer fecal matter from healthy 
mice into the Parkinson's uh, mice, the Parkinson's mice gets healthy just Ah. by having a healthy microbiome from a Oh, healthy mouse. wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after that, that prompted me to investigate more about the microbiome. And there's another article that makes a lot of interconnections between mental health and what you eat. So I don't see, I mean, I don't know, a lot of depression in people who are plant-based. I mean, maybe we vegans get depressed because we see like people don't understand that there is no need to kill animals, right? But that's another thing. That's like a more sensible aspect. But I don't see a lot of, uh, you know, mental health issues in the plant-based community. Alzheimer's, you know, there is a lot of doctors who are plant-based, who promote whole plant-based diet to prevent Mm Alzheimer's. -hmm. Mm Uh, I don't know if you know these doctors from, I think they're Harvard graduates, but they practice in California. Uh, Sure size. -hmm. No, I don't know. but but I know even like Dr. You should Neil, interview them. yeah, Yes. even Dr. Neil Barnard and a few people come to Oh, mind yeah. too. The, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, of the plant base. Yeah, yeah. So Mm -hmm. all of them for sure. But um, because I am a neuropathologist, so I'm interested in what causes Alzheimer's, right? What causes Parkinson's disease, things like that. Um, I think there's a lot of findings that show that if you keep a healthy microbiome, it's more difficult to get to get those types of diseases. Yeah. And what do you think are like the best things we can do to ensure we have that healthy microbiome? And do you think sometimes, like sometimes people will go plant-based or raw vegan or vegan and they'll comment on my channel or they'll say like, this is a common thing. Like, oh, I tried it, but I felt so bloated. It means it's not working. Like to me, it's just your body adjusting and your microbiome adjusting and it just takes a bit of time. But why do you think that happens? Does, is that connected to the microbiome you think? And do we need to have more patience as, patience as we transition and foods to Yeah, eat maybe? I would say, you know, don't don't go overnight, like nothing works like that. I mean, there are some people that can do things called turkey, but I feel like, honestly, I feel like Mike's success on sticking to plant-based based diet for over 10 years is because it has been a gradual transition. So I went from omnivore to vegetarian, and then I eliminated dairy and, and eggs. Then I went vegan, but cooked vegan. And then eventually I was high raw vegan. And then eventually it was fully raw vegan. But now with my fitness goals and longevity goals and bone health and all of that, I decided to incorporate more protein. And you know what? I'm going to go high raw vegan again. The same way that it caused me to transition from ve cooked vegan to raw vegan, that adaptation in my bowel transit is the same transition that I had going raw vegan to high raw vegan. It was horrible the first two weeks because my microbiome was not used to digesting beans and all of that. I had to go like probably solid two months to finally be able to assimilate the beans, to be But honest then with is you. it, but then does it get better or no? Yeah. 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 Okay. That's the important part. Yeah. So you just have to hang through that period. Right. And Yes. then like, even though you take a step back for a bit and it feels worse, but then it gets better. Right. Or simplify if you're e eating a lot of ingredients, just because some people say eat the rainbow and the microbiome and, and all of that. Yes. But if somebody is just transitioning, maybe little by little, it's a better approach. Mm hmm. And what do you think it can do to the gut microbiome if people are eating like a heavy meat diet long term? Like, what do you think when, you know, like it's so excessive these days, right? It's like, I get it if you don't want to be vegan or raw vegan or plant based, but to eat like people morning, noon and night animal products, meat, you know, eggs, chicken, salmon, eggs, beef, stir fry, like every day, it's just so excessive. And I think that can lead to a lot of problems. And from what I hear, there's no fiber right in those animal products and that can lead to problems as well don't you think with their gut and then Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there, those are elimination diets, right? Like raw veganism is an elimination diet, if you think about it. Carnivore is an elimination diet. So it's very difficult for people to understand that if you keep a balanced diet, whether it's omnivore or plant-based, you're going to be fine because we like things that are easier or all or nothing or radical things. That's what I've seen and I've experienced. Actually, I'm writing a newsletter about it. Um, that's going to be my next newsletter, but it's just... eliminating certain groups of food is definitely going to make you feel better just because your body is able to deal with one ingredient at the time. Same with keto diet, you eliminate carbs, not all of them, but most of them, you eliminate protein and you're just fueling your body with fat that the body has the capacity to convert that fat into carbs, for example. So yeah, I would say it's been shown that if you increase the amount of animal and animal protein and fats from animals, 
your microbiome transforms those fats and proteins into you know harmful molecules that in the mm. long run is gonna get you get get predisposition to atherosclerosis for example yeah. so we don't want that and fiber prevents that fibers prevents the absorption of a lot of fat that is harmful for us so and if yeah, somebody's it's, like you oh. know it's, it's, it's sad that you go from one extreme to the other yeah if somebody's like well it's too extreme for me i don't want to be raw or vegan like what do you think is the next best thing? If somebody's just like, I can't do it. I can't give it up. Do you think like the blue zones diet or just eat it like once a week or like not so much, right? Yeah. I mean, in the ideal world where everybody's compassionate, I would like to see a vegan world where mm -hmm. there is acknowledgement that there's limitations of the vegan diet. Therefore, with the technology that we have, we can supplement. But that I don't see that happening in the short term. Yes. Yeah. No. Whenever. Yeah. The, the world tends to compensate. I, I see it in the big picture. Like if you have so much of something, there's going to be like the counterpart that is going to try to balance that. So yeah, the healthier way, if you're taking your ethical, you know, if, if you don't want to pay attention to the sentient beings being killed and all of that, uh, I would say pescatarian probably mm. is the healthier. Yeah. And what would you say motivates you personally to like stick to this lifestyle? For me? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just cannot kill an animal myself. Yeah. I just can't. So if I, I can't cannot, either. Yeah. I, you know, I, I just accept the limitations of the plant-based diet and use the technology and knowledge that we currently have to make up for it. Because I feel like if we take plant-based diet, like the panacea for everything, that's when we are falling short and the people who are against veganism are going to come after us to hit on those efficiencies and those things that are proven to be deficient. So mm -hmm. if we acknowledge that, that there is restrict limitations and we actively pursue, um, you know, filling in the gaps of those limitations that I think we're going to be better off. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. And I have some amazing questions from my viewers. So I'm just going to pull those up, but I want to ask you too, like as a doctor and as somebody so health conscious, what are your thoughts on alcohol? Do you drink any alcohol? I know some people think it's like in moderation, it's healthy. It takes away stress. It has some antioxidants, like organic wine or certain things like this. I mean, I used to be a heavy drinker. I would now class myself, classify myself as an alcoholic, even though I didn't at the time, like I had to drink every day or I'd get major anxiety and withdrawal symptoms. It was so crazy. I drank every day through my twenties and into my thirties. And now 41, I gave up alcohol. I've had maybe two glasses of wine in five years and it's such a better life to me. Uh, but what do you think? What are your thoughts on that? And then I'll just pull up these viewers questions. Sure. Well, I don't drink. I never, it was never attractive to me. Um, so Good. wow. I would say that if it's not building you up, why would you have something that destroys you even in a tiny, tiny bit, you know, it's a compromise to your liver. I, I wouldn't do it. If you want vitamin E and tocopherols and all the antioxidants, just have grapes, you know, just have a, a supplement. But, you know, yeah. twister, I feel like some people need the wine for socializing aspects. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good that you recognize that if you are dependent on it, like if you cannot go one day without it, to recognize, stop, self-reflect and, you know, you say, what can I substitute my alcohol problem with? You know, like when yeah. I was trying to quit coffee, because I had like three cups a day just to keep up with my demands of uh, training, right? I said, what can I do? And I started switching things so I I went for chocolate hot chocolate and then I went for the matcha and then I went for coconut and then I went for green juice so there is always ways to have sometimes it's just the attachment you know to have like a little cup and be happy you know yeah to and if somebody's <laughs> struggling with like their mental health and they're sorry you might be able to hear my daughters they're home today they're not usually here when I have interviews they're screaming right here trying to run into the frame <laughs> But if somebody's struggling with like mental health problems and they're like, oh, you know, I'm going through such a dark time, but I don't want to take medication. I don't know what to do. Like, what is your advice for somebody watching if they're going through a hard time? Are there certain foods they can impact? Do you think exercise, like exercise, for me, exercise and sleep, like you were saying, yeah. I was my little children here. My, I have a five and a half year old. I swear to you, I only the last week started sleeping. Like I was sleep deprived from breastfeeding her and from she the kids have been like, I love them so much, but a lot of work, obviously, as a yeah. mom who works. And I was sleep deprived for five and a half years. I've only just started prioritizing my sleep. I go to bed with them now at like 830. So I sleep like this week, I've slept 10 hours. Wow. I've been in the gym committed to 60 minutes a day. 
it just does wonders for your mental health, right? Even getting moving. It's like Tony Robbins says, you want to change your life, change your state, like get moving. That does a lot too, right? Yes. Uh, and even, you know, you wouldn't believe, but sometimes I have my depressive days and mm -hmm. I said, what can I do? It's just having the awareness, you know, like I feel like I feel horrible right now, but what can I do to change this? Listening to your favorite music, just jumping in your trampoline, start decluttering your closet, like all of those things, just the movement as Tony Robbins says, just change your your environment a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And okay. Somebody said any tips for overcoming autoimmune diseases? Oh, that's, I mean, there's so many autoimmune diseases, but I would say that if you fix your microbiome and if you increase the amount of antioxidants and nutrient dense food that you eat, preferably plant-based. I mean, we have so many doctors that help people mm -hmm. overcome autoimmune diseases like Dr. Brooke Olner, you know, yeah. Um, so if you can follow her, I'm not an expert on lupus or, you know, autoimmune diseases. So I would, you know, recommend her for you to, to listen to what she has to say, uh, because she has so many case studies of success. Yeah, I think with a lot of people, it can really be tied to the gut. I know when I initially before I went raw, I had major health problems, and digestive problems, panic attacks, all these problems. And then a doctor said, I think you have celiac, like I think you have a major intolerance to gluten. And then just removing gluten, I felt like no more brain fog, a total transformation. And then if I would reintroduce it after removing it, I would get so sick for five days in bed. But then after being raw vegan for a couple of years, I had it by accident a couple of times on a cheat day in Miami, like this vegan flatbread pizza that I found out had gluten in it. And then I had no reaction. So I tested it a few more times. I'm like, this is crazy. So then it made me realize in my case, maybe it was like heavily tied to my gut. My gut was just so weak and yeah, now before. your gut has all this microbiome that is able to keep up with it. Um, so much starts in the gut, don't you think? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a garden, you know, your, your, your gut microbiome. So you have to flower, you have to, um, yeah, water it with the right, the right food. You have to add a little bit of good soil here and there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and somebody said, any advice for someone going through physical rehab after being injured in a car accident? Hmm. Sorry to hear about that. That is, you know, tough. Well, you know, I, I, I have the doctor title, but you know, there's different subspecialties. So mm -hmm. I like to tell you exactly what you need to do, but it's just a matter of what kind of injury, uh, injury you had, you know, if it's the neck or something that compromises the, the spine, I wouldn't touch that. And I wouldn't, so there are, I would say, keep a positive attitude. Sometimes the mental um, so follow the physical therapist advice, try to stay in your, in your, in your healthy weight. That's going to help you a lot. If you can mm -hmm. move, do mm -hmm. it gradually. Don't try to run when you cannot even walk, for example, and then the mental health aspect and the relief system, right? Like Joe Dispenza, he, yeah. you know, his story, right? He, yeah. uh, he was paralyzed and then he's back to normal. So I think that could help. Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. So I'll cut that part, but yeah, my little daughter's just joined us. <laughs> so we're going to finish off with her. She's amazing. Right, Victoria. We have an amazing doctor you can learn from right here. So, okay. The next question is what are your essentials in terms of food supplement lifestyle and activities? Oof. I mean, it takes a while to build and you have to make it work around your lifestyle. Right. So for me, essentials would be like a nice mattress just to have proper rest a nice routine before sleep, going to bed to warranty that you're going to have enough sleep because if you don't, no matter how organic your strawberries are, if you don't sleep properly, it's not going to work. Yeah. So prioritize your sleep and then, you know, it's cliche, but be, visualize the life that you want to create. So just focus on that journal. If you need to listen to your own voice with your affirmations, try to avoid negativity on social media. Sometimes it's very distracting and time consuming. So if it's not going to building you up, just eliminate it. Don't follow accounts that throw at you all sorts of conspiracies that uh, never comes to, you know, to fruition and True. You are worrying for nothing. So yeah, just procure your mental health, procure your sleep and everything else. And, and obviously have a little bit of knowledge in terms of diet and everything is going to fall into place. Yeah. Okay. And if people are wondering what brand B12 you take, are you okay? To oh, say that? I don't remember the brand. Yeah. Okay. I also take a multivitamin just like you. Yeah. Okay. I'll link mine yeah. below. If you guys want, I can put a code with that one too. I've been happy with it and I check my blood work. Yeah. Regularly. I also take 
my blood work and the supplement works wonders. I mean, I I'm, I'm B12 fine, like normal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what is fine for B12? Do you know? I can't remember. Like, I think it might be different here. Is yeah, it like it varies. 200, 200 to 800? To yeah, yeah, yeah. Numbers. It varies. Okay. And I mean, somebody said, I wouldn't like to be, so there's ranges, right? Let, let's suppose, just make a hypothetical count, so to speak. Yeah. The normal value is one to 10. You don't want yeah. to be one or two. You want to be, two, you want to be six, seven or eight or nine or 10. Yeah. So don't be in the lower range. That would be my advice. And just yeah. Google, you know, like normal ranges of vitamin B12, you will yeah. see. Yeah. I think last time I checked, I'm just waiting for blood work right now. The last time I checked, it was in the sevens, I think, which is pretty. Yeah. But yeah. There was a new doctor this time and I just asked to check everything because I'm vegan, but all they checked for, I'm just waiting for it, is diabetes, iron, zinc, omega-3, and vitamin D and B12. But there's so many other things we should check, don't you think? Like if you're going to check your blood work, if you're a vegan, like thyroid, yeah, magnesium, selenium. Yeah. Yeah. In particular, the ones that you are supplementing for. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, I don't know the particular name for the test to evaluate um omega-3s mm -hmm. so but there is some i know there is some so i, I yeah sorry about yeah. i don't no 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 yeah it's great we can check all these things these days yeah. and yeah. somebody said best recipe slash meal ideas for breakfast lunch and dinner so any like easy amazing favorite recipe that comes to mind i know we talked about that a little bit or if you're done talking on that that's okay too yeah i um, mean yeah. for me for practical reasons uh a smoothie is like a very it's, it's very convenient. Yeah. So that would be a perfect uh, breakfast post-workout smoothie with greens. And, you know, some some protein powders can cause bloating when you mix them with greens. So yeah. if you don't use protein powders, I would use chia, hemp, or flax seeds to my smoothie that is composed of berries, bananas, and other fruits and the greens. So yeah. that would be a good recipe for a smoothie. For lunch, I would say fruit or salad and for dinner as well. I, I don't complicate things, you know, as I said, if you go to a Whole Foods or a buffet that has a lot of chopped veggies, just throw in the veggies and mm -hmm. then just one ingredient that is a little bit more dense, like in my case, okay, the lentils or the tempeh or the tofu. And if you want to keep it raw vegan, make it a huge, huge raw vegan salad because otherwise you're not going to get enough nutrition. It has to be huge as a raw vegan yeah. And do you avoid oils or do you think that they're okay? Like flax oil, olive oil. Do you think that these things are okay for us or no? Well, they're, I would say, yes, they have benefits compared to like industrial oil, you know, of the French fries, but I don't find them like super necessary to reverse certain things. Like some people say extra virgin olive oil is super healthy. I wonder if what is healthy was the salad that, that went with the oil or mm -hmm. the oil itself. Yeah. So as a dressing, I don't see any problem with one tablespoon, but as a necessity, like it's a must to have. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. And somebody asked, can raw vegan diet help with perimenopause or menopause? Do you think so? From what I've seen, people have interviewed, they have said from their experience, it has like a lot of them have said they barely had symptoms, but who knows? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. Every woman is different, but yeah, mm -hmm. I just as you, I haven't got into that phase yet. So, um, you know, listen to whoever you trust the most in for that. And uh, I would add resistance training and exercise and trying to eat, you know, supplementing your workouts rather than, because I see a lot in the rubbing community, like, oh, it's just detox. It's just detox. And I wouldn't say rubbing community. I would say like the detox community, because that's another word. It's just detox, you know, you have to keep fasting. You got that. No, sometimes you have to supplement because you are deficient on, on certain things. Mm -hmm. So you just pay attention to that. Like it's not always detox. Sometimes it's deficiencies. Mm -hmm. True. And maybe who are some of your favorite, most inspiring people or pages or channels or podcasts to follow or books? Um, like anything that's totally changed your life or helps keep you inspired? Yeah, I mean, as I said before, my sources were, because I didn't know a lot of uh, raw veganism, my sources were the older raw vegans, right? The ones mm. that I learned from. And I know that they have their biases. So because I can see that as well, now I go to other sources that allow me to cover those biases. So believe it or not, right now, even though I didn't like him before, uh, Lane Norton, I think mm -hmm. he has a very good approach he can be a bully sometimes really? uh, but he is he's very harsh 
because he doesn't sugarcoat anything. So mm-hmm. I think that he criticizes, he 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 throws nasty comments at vegans that are making claims that are not necessarily true. Mm-hmm. He throws a lot of harsh comments on carnivores. So I think that he doesn't take sides, but it can be harsh for people if you don't know. Because he, he uses science to justify what he has to say rather than personal biases or beliefs. And mm-hmm. that's what happens a lot in the, what I've seen in the, you know, detox, roving and community, like it's personal beliefs and anecdotes. And True. yes, we like that. And for sure, if you're telling me that your juice is helping you, I'll try it out, right? Mm-hmm. But also I can investigate for myself, like, is this really helping me? Yeah, absolutely. I will tell you, it is helping. For sure, you're getting a lot of, you know, goodies in there. Uh, but certain things, you know, that are more controversial, like, um, I don't know, breatharianism. I mean, I have no experience with that. I, I only see bad stories on it. It's not something that I practice, so I don't endorse it. No, I couldn't do it. I love food too much. I love food. It's amazing. And that's part of the thing I love about, you know, the raw food diet or a plant-based diet. You can eat more quantities and there's so many amazing things you can eat. It never gets boring. I've been doing this seven years. You've been doing this 10 years or longer. And it's, it's still fulfilling, exciting, fun, amazing. And you fall more and more in love with the foods. And so does you, so do your taste buds, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, this has been amazing. You're such a joy. And I just like your attitude and your aura. You're amazing. Thank you for coming on to share your experience, your knowledge and everything. Is there anything else you feel called to share with the audience before we end off and also let everybody know where they can find you and I'll link everything down below as well. Do you have any books or eBooks or any of that? Also yeah. anything you have a link below at the moment, I haven't had anything like a, you know, like a book or something, but uh, I started with the newsletter. You can check it out at drorelli.com. Uh, you can follow me on YouTube. It's the same nickname. I used to be a raw vegan doctor, but now I'm Dr. Aureli. So Dr. Aureli on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter or X. Um, and yeah, just keep an eye, subscribe to the newsletter if you want to know why I'm implementing these changes. And that would be it for now. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. You were great. Thank you so much for coming on. And mm-hmm. to the viewers, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope it added some value to your day. If it did, I'm sure it did. Give it a subscribe and be sure to like this video. And I will put two amazing other videos on the screen right now. I'll put the recent Dr. Barnard interview. He's a plant-based doctor. He was amazing. And I will also put an interview with Chef Babette. She's in her 70s. She's been living this lifestyle for decades and she looks amazing. So I think that's one of the top videos on this channel. It's so good. Check it out. And we love you guys. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.